In this module, we will cover the basic techniques used to perform a complete postmortem examination or a necropsy in amphibians. This presentation focuses on anurins, but the techniques reviewed can also be applied to other amphibian species. A necropsy is an important component of any amphibian conservation program. A complete necropsy with histopathology provides an invaluable opportunity to understand how a disease affected an animal and may help to explain its death. In addition, it also provides an opportunity to collect tissue samples for additional testing and may help further our understanding of diseases in amphibians. A complete necropsy is composed of two basic elements, a macroscopic or gross examination of the body and organs, followed by a microscopic or histologic review of the tissues. We will focus on the macroscopic aspect of the necropsy as the microscopic exam requires specialized laboratory facilities to process the tissues and should be carried out by an individual with advanced training in histopathology. It should be noted that a gross necropsy will only provide a fraction of the complete case picture and it should always be complemented by a histologic review and interpretation. Although this module is intended as a reference for veterinarians, trained field personnel can apply these techniques to complete a gross necropsy under most circumstances. It should be noted that all of the photographs in this presentation were obtained during routine necropsy procedures on animals that died as a result of pre-existing illness. No animals were euthanized for the purpose of this necropsy. In this tutorial, we will cover facilities, equipment, and preparations necessary prior to a necropsy, as well as a review of the techniques to perform a necropsy on amphibians. Although a complete discussion on biosecurity principles is beyond the scope of this tutorial, a few key principles are discussed throughout the presentation. But before we start, we should ask the question of why perform a necropsy. A complete and thorough necropsy can help determine a cause for the death of an animal. It can provide information that contributes to the body of knowledge of that particular species, as well as to the pathogenesis of a disease and how it affected the host. Under a quarantine situation, it can help identify and prevent the introduction of diseases into an amphibian collection, and it can also provide valuable insights into the effectiveness of certain medical treatments. Finally, a complete diagnostic necropsy provides one of the best opportunities to detect emerging infectious diseases in an animal or a group. Whether in a laboratory or under field conditions, a necropsy should be carried out in an area separate from those designated for the medical care of animals or for quarantine. Ideally, it should be in a separate room or building with an independent ventilation system and access to electricity and running water. The working surfaces and the floor should be made of non-porous materials that can be easily cleaned and disinfected. Instruments and equipment used for a necropsy should not be used for any other purpose. All the equipment used for a necropsy should be cleaned and disinfected before attempting another necropsy. This will help to prevent cross-contamination of any samples collected. Most necropsies on amphibians can be completed with a simple set of instruments and sample collection containers. It is very important to have a plan of action prior to the start of necropsy as this will help maintain efficiency and avoid not having the supplies that you need. Remember that you are most likely the last person to see the animal intact and documenting as much as you can is important. It is always better to collect and store too many samples than to find out later that the tissues or samples necessary for a critical diagnosis were not collected. Adding a camera to the necropsy kit can help document any abnormal findings and under field conditions, any environmental factors that may have played a role in the death of the animal. A necropsy kit should contain a notebook or standard necropsy form in which to keep detailed notes as well as writing implements and a ruler for taking any measurements, containers with formalin or other suitable tissue fixative. For most amphibians, a small iris scissors and forceps will suffice. More delicate instruments such as those used for ocular surgery are well suited for smaller amphibians. Culture swabs and transport media and a variety of containers for collecting samples such as syringes and plastic bags, paper tags for later tissue identification, 
and cryovials for frozen tissue sample archiving should all be at hand. Scales are important for recording the weight of the animal and glass slides can be used to prepare cytologic specimens for diagnostic purposes. Latex gloves should be worn as they are important for maintaining biosecurity and should be changed before another necropsy is started. Cleaning and disinfection supplies are also important to prevent possible contamination of samples and to maintain biosecurity. A dissecting microscope, if available, is of great help when working with very small amphibian species. 10% neutral buffered forlin is the tissue fixative of choice for histopathology. This can be acquired from a commercial provider or prepared in-house by mixing these components. Alternatively, ethanol at a concentration of 70 to 90 percent can be used as a fixative. Tissue samples should not be thicker than 5 millimeters and should be fixed in a container with at least nine times the volume of formalin to tissue. In some instances, decomposition of the body will make it impossible to identify and collect tissues for histopathology. However, with access to modern molecular diagnostic techniques, there are some diseases that can be diagnosed even in animals as decomposed as these shown here. Presented here is a basic guide for an amphibian necropsy. You can pause this tutorial at this time to reference the guide. Two necropsy techniques based on the size of the animal are discussed. In animals that are smaller than 20 grams, the body cavity should be carefully exposed, appropriate samples collected, and then placed in the fixative solution for whole body histopathology. In larger animals, once the body cavity is exposed and appropriate samples are collected for microbiology and tissue archival, the entire salomic viscera are examined and all organs are sampled for histopathology. We will focus on this method. But before we do, there are several anatomic features of importance in amphibians that should be kept in mind during the examination, including the subcutaneous lymph space, salomic fat bodies, bitter's organ, and the paravertebral endolymphatic sacs. Several of these will be illustrated in the following images. Once all the tools and implements are ready, it is important to perform a thorough external exam of the body, noting any wounds, lesions, or discolorations on the skin, eyes, and mouth. This is also a good opportunity to check for fractures and other signs of trauma. Here are two examples of eye lesions in two amphibians, and a cloacal prolapse with involvement of the ovary in another animal. To start a necropsy, place the animal in dorsal recumbency and perform a superficial incision that extends from the pectoral area to the inguinal region. Reflect the skin to the sides, which exposes the abdominal muscles and the peritoneal membrane. The potential space that exists between the skin and the body wall is the subcutaneous lymph space. Under certain disease conditions or impaired osmotic balance, this space may become filled with fluid. Samples of this fluid, if present, may be collected for cytology and culture. Incise through the peritoneal membrane from the pectoral area to the inguinal region. This exposes the heart, lungs, liver, portions of the gastrointestinal tract, and the urinary bladder. If there is accumulation of fluid within the salomic space, this fluid can be collected at this time with a syringe and needle for cytology and culture. This is a good opportunity to collect a small sample of liver and place it in a cryovial for frozen archival. This sample could be used for toxicology or nutritional assays. It can also be used for virus isolation. With the lungs reflected cranially, the gastrointestinal tract, spleen, kidneys, and gonads, in this case ovaries and oviduct, can be better visualized. The ovaries in this animal are inactive. In reproductively active females, the ovaries can become massively enlarged with ova and fill the entire coelom. Note the absence of salomic fat bodies in this case, which is indicative of prolonged negative energy balance. The spleen lies within the mesentery at the intersection of the stomach and the intestinal tract, typically on the right side of the body. 
Due to the small size of the spleen, it is best to collect it as soon as it is seen and place it in a plastic cassette so that it is not lost in the formalin container. The heart can be removed at this time and also placed in a plastic cassette. The lungs should be examined for discolorations, fluid accumulation, or parasites. To sample the lungs, each lobe should be severed as close as possible to the trachea, at which point they usually deflate and collapse. However, in many cases, the lungs will collapse as soon as the body cavity is opened. If there has been accumulation of fluid within the coelom, the lungs are often collapsed by the fluid pressure and are recessed into the cranial coelom. The urinary bladder can be sampled at this time. Please take note of any contents present in the bladder. To remove the remaining viscera, make an incision along the bottom jaw and reflect the tongue ventrally. This exposes the oral cavity and the caudal aspect of the eyes. Examine this area for abscesses or other lesions. Using gentle traction, elevate the tongue and undermine the soft tissue connections of the viscera and reflect until the distalmost aspect of the colon is all that remains attached. This is a good time to collect, if necessary, a sample of kidney into a cryotube for potential ancillary diagnostics, such as rainovirus PCR. Once the distal colon is severed, a fecal sample can be collected and analyzed for intestinal parasites. Place the entire viscera in formalin. The head, limbs, and samples of the body wall can also be placed in formalin at this time. As a comparison, the image on the left shows a female toad during a reproductively active period with highly developed ovaries and oviducts. In contrast, in the image on the right, the testicles of a male toad are visible and their anatomical relationship to salomic fat bodies and the kidneys is seen. At this point, the actual necropsy procedure has been completed. The species and biometric data and any necropsy findings should be recorded in a standardized form, such as this one, as soon as the necropsy is finished. Having a standard form will help maintain a systematic approach and prevent missing any observations during the necropsy. A number of useful references and resources are listed here. Additional resources can be found at the Amphibian Arc website. Thank you for your time and attention, and good luck with your future amphibian projects.